goes up to the following uh, situation, to a series of rooms, to four rooms. So each uh, stack is, serves four rooms, and but then screens, foldable screens can define, kind of uh, can make two rooms out of uh, one room out of two, or even one room out of uh, four. So that uh, one family could occupy one spiral staircase and can live around one spiral staircase, or it could be uh, kind of really uh, occupied by individuals. And this is a close-up of the situation around the spiral staircase, the staircase, a kind of uh, foldable, collapsible lobby, uh, a bed, a desk, a chair, and uh, a kind of bathroom also located in a grid. So I think this is really taking abs abstraction as far as it uh, could go. Then uh, the first time Leonidov himself uh, uh, approaches housing is in a scheme for Magnitogorsk. And really to show the difference between him and his colleagues, I want to show some two earlier schemes or two other alternative schemes for Magnitogorsk. Magnitogorsk was an industrial city in the South Euro uh, with an enormous iron, iron uh, iron ore mines and a kind of metal steel factory that was kind of developed by the uh, Soviets. And, it, and just the kind of settlement of that area became uh, uh, a long series of, became a very elaborate competition. And this is a project by Ginsberg and Orchitowicz, uh, which basically uh, consists of a road and a series of uh, a linear building, only one story tall, and uh, a series of incidents that were partly related to incidents in nature that, uh, were, that contained social services. So basically it is a road, uh, stations in the road, then around uh, those stations there would be collective facilities such as restaurants, schools, et cetera, et cetera. But basically each individual in this scheme would live in a room and in an identical room with a staircase, a, a toilet, a bed, a desk, uh, a chair, and uh, two uh, balconies and with a window. And in the winter, uh, the window would be closed and in the summer it could be open so that you were almost living in nature. And the whole scheme consisted of an endless ribbon of these identical rooms. So basically a, a very anti-urban uh, sensibility that became even more uh, pronounced in the <coughs> second version of the same scheme where the rooms were not even arranged in a row anymore but where they were kind of scattered and atomized in, in a building such as this one, a one-person dwelling, a two-person dwelling or family dwelling and, for, and, and because it was obvious that uh, bachelors uh, could in such circumstances uh, never uh, uh, never uh, pick find each other, uh, would never kind of uh, interact with each other. There would be bachelor buildings uh, to create the required number of uh, marriages and kind of biological connections. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and here we have a kind of a view, view of this, uh, of this uh, scheme. So. Uh, the constructivist really, after dealing with, this, with the city through uh, the process you all know, in 1930 had really come to a stage where they became completely anti-urban, uh, and or anti-urban, but at least, uh, yeah, anti-urban, there's no other word for it, kind of believed in the scattering of, of individuals in the landscape. And uh, again, Leonidov, I think, really has it uh, denies this contradiction between urbanity and anti-urban tendencies by creating uh, also a linear city but in a completely uh, different system. This is an early version of it. Uh, uh, the city was kind of uh, based on a highway and then, um, as you will see later, it is based on a highway here and then a linear city that is divided in three linear zones. The central zone for housing, uh, uh, the one outer zone for cultural facilities and leisure, and another zone for uh, for pleasure pleasure activities and sports, healthy healthy pleasure. But here we can see that he doesn't really commit himself to either uh, high rise or low rise architecture or urban and anti urban architecture, but that he simply alternates the two. 
So people could live either in towers or in very low buildings or in towers or in very low buildings. And if such a scheme seems monotonous, you have to realize or kind of imagine that it would be uh, moving such a belt to an extremely uh, violent and agitated landscape and that therefore there would always be uh, natural incidents that would give character to the different segments. And basically, both the high-rise and the low-rise elements are organized in exactly the same way. Uh, this is a plan of it. There would be a cruciform double-height space. And in the corners of that cruciform space, there would be rooms. So to, uh, uh, a room for an individual, each, each individual would have his own room, a room with a desk and a bed and a bathroom. And uh, so there would be uh, eight rooms on, on the first floor. <coughs> and then you could take a staircase and go again to eight floors, uh, eight rooms on the second floor, so that uh, 16 people would share one of these uh, units. And then the double height space was uh, subdivided in a breakfast area, a greenhouse, a sports area, and an entrance area. So here we see the kind of a perspective uh, in these rooms, the double height space, the kind of gymnasium section, the lounge, the breakfast area, here in elevation. And always, uh, in the case of low-rise, kind of immediate communication with nature, and in the case of high-rise, the uh, superb perspectives of the wild uh, Ural Mountains. Um, here again, kind of this shows that the tower is simply a uh, kind of superimposition of uh, six of the low-rise houses connected by an external elevator with a little bridge uh, leading to the same lobby. So also in terms of density, each of these sectors contains the same number uh, of inhabitants. You have to imagine that this uh, scheme was, uh, the, uh, the drawings of this scheme were produced in, uh, in overnight, literally after three weeks of discussing this scheme, Leonidov said, okay, I'll go ahead and start at nine o'clock uh, at night and was finished uh, at uh, 10 the next morning. And this, uh, door, this model, for instance, was uh, 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 drawn on a blackboard with, with chalk. And uh, these objects were just uh, taken. Uh, but, I mean, you have to realize that all these things were done really under phenomenal speed. And here we have a kind of uh, a drawing which is almost cruel in its uh, economy. Uh, can, can, can you focus it? Because it's because basically all the information for the whole scheme is contained in this single drawing. Uh, here we have a plan of the ground floor of the house, a plan of the second floor of the house, uh, minus the void, a plan, a close-up of one of the sleeping rooms of the house, an elevation of the house, an inside elevation of the house, an isometric of the house. So basically all the information uh, which uh, underlies the whole scheme is given in this one single drawing, which is, uh, at the same time, ex uh, as anybody can see, extremely uh, kind of aesthetically rewarding and, and rich and almost, uh, and I think which contains latent signs of, of a kind of almost Chinese sensibility here. Here we have an, uh, a kind of also drawn in chalk uh, kind of uh, elevation. And here you see that the kind of speed got uh, better of him, with the kind of all these towers having different vanishing points and being on different uh, of different heights. But you can see that uh, in every single aspect of of, of Linnaeus' work, there's always this kind of fantastic uh, bonding of formalism and utilitarianism, <coughs> even in the smallest uh, uh, in the smallest details. This is a little pavilion for morning gymnastics to be shared by men and women, and it's organized in such a way, this is the ground floor, a series of lockers kind of separates men from women, there's a circular shower, but it doesn't quite separate them, there's kind of a <coughs> gap here and a gap there, so that there's some possibility of, of, of tension. But anyway, so they, they get kind of undressed uh, in uh, their respective parts, and then the sexes join each other here on the ramp, and kind of uh, indulge in uh, gymnastics again. So <laughs> even the, the, the very kind of simplest uh, and kind of most boring part of uh, such a scheme contains all those a long series of, of metaphors that doesn't in any way kind of detract from the usefulness uh, of them. Well, 
Uh, and this is really the end of the lecture, We're kind of introducing the next uh, part. All these claims for Magnitogorsk uh, were in no, uh, were uh, rejected by the Soviet uh, regime. And this Magnitogorsk competition really represents <coughs> the moment that the Soviet regime, which had uh, so far supported the constructivists and uh, almost uh, considered them their official architects, uh, decided that they were uh, involved in a completely nonsensical operations and that what they needed was uh, kind of hard-headed uh, real functionalism, true functionalism, and uh, summoned the uh, kind of European leftist uh, avant-garde, uh, s people such as Ernst May, uh, Hans Schmidt, and Matt Stamm, to come to Russia and to take things in hand. And I think that uh, that is maybe one of the most uh, kind of shattering and traumatic moments in, in the history of modern architecture, because whether they knew it or not, and it is debatable uh, what the situation was, that act of the European specialists, uh, so-called, was a blatant act of betrayal toward their kind of uh, uh, modern colleagues in Russia. And then in 1933, Frank Lloyd Wright visited uh, Russia and kind of uh, declared himself uh, in favor of the academics, or the at least uh, in a euphemism, the eternal values of architecture, and that became then one of the uh, one of the kind of daggers that were put in in the back of conservatism. Here we have Leonidov, and these are the three Western brothers, and just the kind of I think this is the Osa group of architecture, and this is. Ginsburg, who we'll, we will later see, was first a uh, teacher of Leonidov and later became his patron. Um, this is a building by Ginsburg from which uh, where all the architects of the author group kind of met every week to discuss uh, their magazine in this uh, bay window. And this is a very familiar picture to uh, all of you, no doubt. And it's uh, extremely but uh, to put it in its true context, it is important to consider that that building is visible here. And I think that uh, this image is may maybe the most devastating kind of comment on the relative importance of constructivism in the socialist uh, scene, or in the, in the true uh, situation in Ru Russia. There's a planetarium here, and there is this building there. But as we will see, kind of Stalinism dominates in every uh, possible sense. And well, here we have the two kind of juxtaposed. And this is just as a kind of um, uh, promise or a kind of indication of the course Leonidov will take. After all the rectangles, after all the kind of completely rectangular aesthetics, suddenly something snaps. And this is the first uh, example of the kind of of the other phase of Leonidov, where uh, this is a piece of furniture from 1932. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, questions? I okay. Are there any questions? I, I would like to answer questions if there ex are there. If I, I should remind everybody that Rem is doing the second part of this series next Tuesday at the same time, same place. And I think it'd be best to keep yeah, the conversation maybe, maybe. for after that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.